First off, I just want to thank Church. You guys have been absolutely amazing in this last three weeks or so for my family and coming for myself and our close family just praying with us, the wonderful messages they've sent, the amazing family that you've been. It's been absolutely amazing, <laughs> again, to be on this side of you guys. So I just really appreciate and thank you for the support. We've had a, 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 not an amazing, but an interesting couple of weeks where we had mum passing away uh, and then Bex's wedding. And to try and kind of get, that, get yourself over the one and then up for the other was something which was impossible. Which I looked at and I thought, this mountain is too hard to climb. But it was amazing what God did, just in His grace and in His mercy, how He got us up for everything that was needed. And, and His goodness is absolutely, undeniably good. So thanks, everybody. I wanted to just really take this opportunity to thank the church for standing by us. And all is good. Um, I just thought to share this morning um, on faith. So it kind of is amazing for me that right from the prayer meeting at the beginning, things of faith started to come through. And um, faith is so important because without it, we can't please God. Without faith, we actually can't please our Father in heaven. And Hebrews 11.6, and most of what I'm going to share about this morning is from Hebrews. But Hebrews, 6, uh, Hebrews 11, verse 6 says this, And without faith it's impossible to please Him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists, and that He rewards those who seek Him. So faith is very foundational to believing in Jesus. Faith is everything, because it says here, how can we believe in a God we can't see if we have no faith? So God expects faith of us. He, the Holy Spirit enables us to have faith. And so faith is so important. In the Karkloof, where we, my dad used to farm, um, we um, were dairy farmers, but every once in a while we would plant a crop of potatoes. You know, 15, 20 hectares of potatoes. Plant at the right time would really... Good thing for the cash flow. And if you caught it right, it was, uh, you know, the pr potato price could be way up and it could be really good. My dad used to say potatoes were a sorry crop. And when I asked him why, he said, because you're either sorry you planted them at all or you're sorry you didn't plant more. So we used to do this. And um, it was always a, a, like a big, uh, take a big deep breath when you bought the seed which was a whole potato. It's not like it's, it's a, a whole potato which has been certified, gone through a whole big story. It's seed, very expensive. <laughs> fertilizer and chemicals, huge amounts of fertilizer for potatoes. More than we would have planted for maize or for pastures, which we were used to doing. And so you take this enormous step of faith, getting all these things together. Bring them back from the, co the local co-op and put them safely in your shed. We had a shed at home with a cold room. You can put away your seed and, you know, all the fertile chemicals are safe in the shed. And then you take another big heave, sigh of relief. But, you know, all of these things are no good. The seed and the chemicals and the fertilizer is no good in your shed. Actually, that has to come out of the shed, be loaded on a tractor and trailer, and be carted into a field which has been prepared and ready. And it's, it has to be planted. It has to be put. This very expensive thing that you've just bought has to be thrown into the ground and covered over. And once you've finished, you look at the field and you suddenly realize what's invested in the soil. That's the big risky moment where you take all of that and then throw it into the soil and trust God for the rain. And 
you know, control is another thing that came out. You no longer have control over that when you've planted it. It's no longer in your shed, in the cold room, where it can keep for a good long while, where it's safe, but where it's doing nothing, where it's lying dormant, and where it's not going to improve or serve anyone or any purpose. It's just sitting It's an amazing picture for us. And there's a very close parallel. See, if you do plant that, trusting God for the rain, then He takes over because then the seed, the potato itself, begins to work as God made it to. And it germinates and produces 30, 60, 100 times what you put in the soil. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. But that's not going to happen when it's all safely in the shed. Very close parallel, what it looks like to live by faith. So it's a story about a potato, Angus Buchan's favorite story. And that's, I have first-hand experience of, but there's a wonderful parallel, which we all have first-hand experience of as well, in terms of our own faith, in terms of our, ourselves. Um. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a thing with our with with our own lives as well. So, to take what God has given us, to throw it into His kingdom, to throw it into the life of His kingdom, is a faith step. He is a He has equipped us and given us even things which when we take those things and sow them the same way as you sow the potato into God's kingdom, those things are no good in our own hands. They're fruit that never ripens. So to, to go back some weeks. But actually we take the things God's given us and we sow them into, into the kingdom, into the field of God's kingdom, where they begin to produce and become something um, that is amazing, serving God. See, if we don't, the potential is all there, like the seed and the potatoes. It's all in, the potential is all there and it's intact. But it actually takes that throwing it in, that planting of what you have, planting the potato, planting the things God's given you, planting yourselves into the field of the life of the kingdom of God. It takes that to start to see all the stuff that we expect from God. But it starts with us actually ex showing and, and exercising that faith. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful adventure. It's an exciting adventure. Of which many of us are in right now. In that stage. That adventure. Strin and Tandy are about to... You know, isn't it amazing that just this time last year we were at... The, probably the very church that you're going to join. Church Unlimited uh, invited us up there, and if you remember, and then we went to Gotwana. There's a little church there, and then we went to the top of the hill. Another church there, Johnny was with us, remember? So God is good. Friends, really what we're talking about is um, the fact that we're called to plant our lives into the field of God's kingdom. And that is to live by faith. So I'm just going to answer two questions. won't be long this morning. But just firstly, what does it mean to live by faith? What is this actually? I just want to try and give us um, some handles. And secondly, um, how do we walk by faith? Just some handles into, we come away from today, God having spoken to us, but some handles that we can take. Okay, so how do we actually do this? How do we take this step of faith? I realize this, that unless, we can be full of potential, but until we take the step into that place of where we need to exercise faith, faith isn't appropriated. It's there. The potential is complete because God's given it to us, but it requires us to step out of, uh, you know, to plant that potato, Peter, to step out of the boat into the water before he could see the result of his faith in that he could walk on the water. Before we can see the result of our faith and planting a crop, a very expensive crop, it has to go in the ground. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction 
of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It just so much doesn't make sense if all you are living your life by is things that you can see. It, that doesn't make sense. And I told this story before. We've got to be able to trust in things we can't see. God, we've got to trust Him. We can't see Him. But a very simple and obvious um, example is standing on the beach. You can only see a certain distance out to sea. But because you can't see what's beyond the horizon, does not mean that there's no sea there. <laughs> it's that obvious a thing not to trust God. And so we do. We cast our trust on Him. So the first thing we're going to have a look at is to have the assurance of things to hope for. Being sure what God has promised us in His Word. So what we're living by is what God's promised us in His Word and not, why we, what, not on what we can see around us. This church has survived and thrived just in this way. Whenever God has brought to us a thing that He needs us to do, it requires resources and you think, well, how are we going to ever manage that? When we trusted Him, He always brought it to be. And even now, to this point, amazing things happen in our lives, all of us. This is how God wants us to live, trusting Him. Some amazing examples of being sure of what God has promised, um, <clears throat> being the, having the assurance of things hoped for. The first one is found in... Um, uh, well, we're just going to read from Hebrews 11.7. 7. It's a story about Noah, but it's from Hebrews. By faith, Noah being warned by God concerning the events as yet unseen. God speaks to Noah about the flood that's coming. It's not come. It's never, ever been before. The likelihood is, I, I don't know, the statistical people amongst you would be able to say, it's never happened before and it's never happened again since. But God said to Noah, I'm bringing something that's going to require you to build a big boat, a big, big ark. And I can imagine in the Middle East, it probably wasn't near any big body of water, not that big anyway. And Noah begins to build. And he builds this enormous ark. I think I saw a movie one day, and, and one of the, the scenes was of the local people were, were, um, were teasing Noah and ridiculing him. But him, him and his family kept building. So... In reverent fear constructed, no, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he, con he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. I'm read that again. By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Noah, without, never before having seen what God was going to bring, builds a boat. There was nothing that he could see with his eyes, that he could trust in his own intellect, that would have led him to build a boat. But because God said so, he builds this enormous boat. And then proceeds to fill it with animals, which was even more ridiculous in that moment, in that time. But he just does it by faith. And it's a beautiful example when God leads us into something, how we can trust him as we sung this morning and how we can walk into what he's given us. That's Noah. And then we look at Abraham in Hebrews 11, uh, Hebrews 11 verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. Imagine leaving a place of safety where you have built up a home and an environment which supports all of your family. God says, okay, off you go. Yes, Lord, wonderful where. I'm not telling you, but you must go. That required enormous faith for him to do that. And you hear of people doing that occasionally, but... Here he was, uprooted everything and just went because God said, just go. God could have said to him, I want you to leave here and I'm going to see what we would like is to know exactly where we're going. 
then we know what we're going from to what we're going to. But there's no faith required in that. And so God says to him, go, leave here, and I'll, I'll show you where on the, on the way. But he knew, because God told him, that there was an inheritance there for him. And so he left. He took an enormous step of faith. Imagine him explaining to his family, so we're leaving. But, that, you know, where to? No, we'll see as we go. It's not a very convincing answer to lead your family with. But that's what he did. And off they went. Friends, maybe for us, the Holy Spirit's spoken something over your lives. Maybe the Holy Spirit has spoken something personally to you that is dormant, that's sitting there. Begin to exercise faith into that. Begin to position yourselves to receive that, that you know God has spoken to you. Begin to walk in that. I have two small examples, just more personally. So Doug leaves here to go to Plet, and the whole polar world collapses, and he feels like in God, he has a small nine hectares of land, which is nothing in, in terms of a, a, a proper farming, commercial farming operation. So he's off and he goes down there. And we have these many conversations where I had felt, and I said to him, you know, you're a bit like Abraham. You're building an ark. And then he does something even worse. He says to the community, I'm going to plant vines and I'm going to go grapes and then we're going to have wine here. There was a, there was, there was a vineyard, but it was struggling. And everything that Doug certainly didn't want. But he felt comfortable. He, we prayed through it. felt like it was in God to do this thing. He plants a vineyard. And like Noah, many people, especially the, the big growers down in Stellenbosch, were saying, man, you're crazy. No one's ever done that before. And the one that is happening is, you know, it's on its way out. What on earth do you think you're doing? Do you know anything about wine? All to which Doug had to answer, well, no. And yes, you, I'm sure you're right. But we're going to do this. I don't know how many months ago, six months ago, three months ago. Three months ago, on this side of him, sat Anton Rupert. And on this side of him, sat Graham Beck. And they were in a competition for the best bubbly uh, in the country. And Dougie got the award over these two great players, top of the game, a little fellow from Plet, that God put there and said to him, grow vines, got the award. So, when we do just extend and trust God, these things happen. He so nearly gave up along the way, many times, but he didn't. Kept going. And all of a sudden this thing popped. And as you can imagine, now there are all sorts of spin-offs. Um, um, and so, friends, that, that was the one thing. I mean, when we moved from the Midlands to here, I went to see an old farmer who had farmed a long time and I respected up in the car roof, and I said to him, you know, um, I'm thinking of leaving. And, um, and he said, Andy, I, I think that you're doing the wrong thing. You've got cattle, they're safe, it's milking, your dad did it, and your dad's dad did it. Don't go. Anyway, we did come. Because we felt in God this was a time to move. It's amazing. We've been here for 25 years. There's not a day, not one, that we've regretted making the move that we had. In my family were people that were hammered by the floods in Des Moines who were very loud in my ear saying, you don't know what that is like. You should never go there. If you want to farm sugar, then go somewhere else. But when we drove through here one day, I saw what I thought was really amazing sugar cane, but more than that, I felt in my heart, God just putting our feet down. And so we came back and did. And when I got here, the farm was already 
being sold that I'd come for. And God made a way that we got that farm instead of someone who could afford it with his pocket money. And so here we were, established in Monzi, never to look back again. Friends, when we do take these steps of faith, when we trust in God for them, then He opens a way. He will provide for us. And that has been our, ex our, our experience as well, as what we see in Scripture. Just remember, maybe a word from somebody through prophecy. I'm asking us all now as a church, you will remember words God has given you. Words that you know that the Holy Spirit's confirmed. Take hold of those again. Align yourselves with them. Do something that aligns yourself with them and begin to walk in that. And watch what happens. While that, while that word over your life that God sent for you is put away in the shed of your heart, it's going to produce nothing. It'll stay safe there, but it'll produce nothing. Take it out of the shed where it's nice and safe. Plant it into the field of God's kingdom where it becomes living and active and powerful just like God's word. And when you believe that, you'll be able to see and experience the fruit. So that is then having the assurance of things hoped for. The second part to that is to have conviction of things not seen. To have conviction, conviction of things not seen. So Hebrews 11.1 1, just remind us, now faith, it's describing faith. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. To have the conviction of things not seen, we've got to trust God at His word even when we can't see anything. That's not easy to do. So it's almost the same, but not quite, as what we've just spoken about. There's a beautiful picture in Scripture, and I'm going to read it to us. It was the story of Simeon. Um, so Luke chapter 2, verse 25 to 32. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death, before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the, in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you've prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Isn't that beautiful? Simeon was waiting all of his life for that moment. And he was a priest who ministered in the temple. He waited there for God to reveal to him Jesus, who was going to be the Savior of the world. He went nowhere. His whole life centered around that one thing, seeing Jesus, who was going to be the Savior of the world. And so he based his entire life, all of his planning came to one point, which was, I'm waiting here, because God said, I will see Jesus from where I am, from where I stand here. And so that's an amazing story. He hadn't seen Jesus, but he'd heard what God had promised. He heard the promise of God, he took that, and he appropriated that by being in position, waiting. And so Mary and Joseph come with Jesus just to do the normal thing, to register and to do the normal thing, whatever it was. But Simeon was there and his faith produced the moment. So this is faith, friends. This is what it looks like. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. The world walks by sight and not by faith. See, when God calls us to things, if it's a very, if, if, uh, just a quick, very quick example off the top of my head is what we do is we sit down with a pen and paper, plan carefully, which is not wrong, and we work out what we can and can't do. That's how the world does it. It's fine. It's good. 
But the way that God calls us to do it is to hear Him first, then be obedient, trusting that He's going to supply. Not, ask, not saying to God, uh, well, no, we can't. We can never do that. We don't have the funds or the finances to do that. See, if God's called you, He'll provide that. Our job is to be obedient. We hear God, we, we just trust Him. And then we walk into the future that God has for us. You see, we can stunt our futures by keeping them under lock and key of our own uh, side. Uh, you know, we cut things down to, the, to what we can understand. And so we can stunt what God wants to do just because we don't want to plant the potatoes. We'd prefer to have them in the... Or just so much. No, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't. God is saying, no, you can, you can, you can, you can. When you've heard me, then go. And so that, that is another um, example of where we walk by faith, not by sight. The way that we do things is, hear God first and then just go and do it. And He will provide. But faith is required. And it's, a, it's the most important uh, part of the whole equation is that we have to trust God. When He's called us, He will also provide in that place. So then, answer the second question, how do we walk by faith, friends? And, we, and we, we're reaching the end. Romans 10 verse 17 says this, So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. We hear lots about faith healers, faith this, faith that, faith the next thing. Faith in yourself even. We hear a lot of that too. Trust yourself. Have faith in yourself. That's just really, really uh, empty and airy. And it burns you out when you start trusting yourself and having faith in yourself and believing in yourself. We believe in God because He's called us and has sent us. And so when we believe and have faith based on God's Word, based on the Bible and what it says to us, based on God's promises that we find in His Word, then our faith is placed in the right place. So how, the first, how, first way how is by hearing God speaking to us. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. You can sit quietly in your devotion. You hear God speaking to you. Listen. Listen. And do. When we sit in our devotions and we hear Him speak to us, listen and just follow through. So we, we, are, um, we, we walk by faith by listening to God and then walking in what He said. We, um, we also do when, we, uh, when people operate in their gifts. Someone comes with a word. Listen. So it's through the Bible when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, also in the gifts, when people operate in their gifts and they come and they share, like Dave did this morning, singing from the top, prophetically speaking over Strun and Tundi. That's God speaking to you. Strun and Tundi have to weigh that up and if they agree, that is when the equation is complete and they begin to walk in that. Friends, just reading the Bible systematically is a wonderful way to hear God. Reading it in a way, there's so many good pa um, uh, reading plans. Make sure that what you do is read the whole Bible. Not just some of it. Not just the parts that you like. But read, read the entire word. Because through it, the Holy Spirit will be able to show you, speak to you. And so you hear God. Systematically. And then, um, the last little point on how we walk by faith, once we've heard God in those ways, we then need to exercise that faith. We need to actually begin to exercise. This muscle, for many of us, is not big and strong and well-developed right now. We all need to develop pumlanum luli muscles of faith <laughs> if we want to walk into the things of God. But uh, we certainly don't want to be shy of that. And the way that we develop those muscles is by beginning to exercise. Beginning to exercise faith. 
at every opportunity. Take the opportunity to walk in faith, not by sight. Friends, our eyes can deceive us so badly. And in today's world, where deception is at every turn, if you're trusting your eyes, very often you can be misled and, and, and be deceived. We need to hear God with our eyes shut. Trust Him. Walk in what He said. Grow that big, make a big strong faith muscle. That's what the church requires in these days. Going on into the future, we're going to have to live more and more and more in faith. Trusting God for what He says. Grow nice, big, strong, healthy muscles of faith. And that is what, how, we, how, we, um, how we walk in faith. Then finally, just the conclusion, uh, just to end off what I'm saying, Hebrews 11, 32 to 34 says this, What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who, brought, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war and put foreign armies to flight. Friends, in these days, God is calling us to this. And faith is the way that we complete and that we achieve these things. To conquer kingdoms. And I'm speaking this over this church right now. That if you will, extend faith into what God has for River Church. You will conquer kingdoms. You will enforce justice. You will obtain promises. You will stop the mouths of lions. You will quench the power of fire. You will escape the edge of the sword. You will become strong out of weakness. You will become mighty in war. And you will put foreign armies to flight. Today we are speaking about spiritual things. And this is what God promises you in Christ enabled by the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit, this is what is your call. He's doing extraordinary things through ordinary men and women, just like us, when we give Him that chance. You know, when we, when we plant ourselves in the faith of His kingdom, when we plant our lives in the faith, in faith in the kingdom of God. Faithfully, we do that. Let's be a part of this extraordinary kingdom that belongs to no ordinary king whose name is Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that as we read your word and as we hear you speaking to us, that strengthens our faith. Lord God, we, we hear so clearly right from the beginning of this morning how you've spoken us, to us about trusting you and about having faith, extending faith. Oh Lord God, I pray this morning, help us to step into that which you have already planned and laid out for our lives in faith to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.